let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's uh, do a quick agenda review. Is everyone happy with the agenda? Is there anything that you want to add, remove, change? Any new business or anything like that? All right, folks seem to be happy with it, so let's jump right into it. Uh, Christian, you are here. Vadim is not. Could you let us know uh, the latest in terms of OKD release? Whatever you have. And if you're talking, we don't hear anything. Uh, you might be muted. Okay, Christian, we don't hear you, uh, or you're not around. It's hard to tell. Uh, you are still muted. So let's actually, um, okay, so let's uh, move on. Christian's going to, I think, connect again. Uh, let's move on to documentation updates so, with Brian. Um, okay, so there's not actually a lot to talk about since last time. Um, I did ping Diane earlier, trying to get the DNS switched. So we're, everything's ready to go, and we're just waiting for the DNS to switch over to the new site. So okay. the new site is being served by GitHub. Um, but when it transitions over, we, we, we're all good to go. Wow. Um, other things, 4.9, if you've looked at the main documentation, you'll see that we now have um, versions. So rather than just going to the latest, when you go to the official documentation, the docsokd.io, you now can choose the version that you want. Um, and initially it said latest was 4.9, but I can just see that that's now been resolved. And then the other thing, there's a link to the code of conduct. Um, and Jamie, do you want to talk about that? Or? I think we want sure. To get at, that the, at the docs meeting, we we uh, went over the code of conduct that uh, Diane Pilford, I mean, shared from <laughs> the uh, Ansible group. Who, in turn, actually, if you look at the bottom of that document, they based it on like five or six other uh, code of conducts. So uh, the documentation group uh, signed off on it. We're happy with it. Um, Michael is going to go through and change all of the references. Uh, to Ansible, to OKD, and anything else that, that needs to happen to make it um, our own, so to speak. And of course, we'll add them to uh, attribution at the bottom uh, of our copy. Eventually, that list will just get longer and longer. Um, is there uh, uh, codes of, yes. Um, if anyone has any questions on the code of conduct, that could be answered now, we'd be happy to, to answer it. Uh, or um, you can submit a question later to the group or in the email or anything like that. Any questions that folks would like answered now about our uh, motivation and plans for having a code of conduct? Okay, great. Uh, if anything comes up and you have any questions, feel free to reach out and uh, you know, ideally this will be done by, you know, maybe the end of the month or um, at the latest by the end of next month, and then we'll get it up on the website. And then at the beginning of every meeting, this meeting, docs meeting, uh, we will mention uh, the code of conduct just so that folks attending the meeting um, can be aware of it. And Sandro, if you could do the same in terms of your meeting as well, your subgroup meeting, that would be helpful. Uh, just at okay. the beginning of the meeting mention, you know, you know, this is, you know, as this is an, an event of OKD, um, you know, we have this code of conduct and we ask that people uh, 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 adhere to that. Uh, let's see, I think that's it for docs. Um, and big kudos to Michael, he's not on this call, but he did a lot of work and of course a lot of kudos to Brian. Um, my theory is that the DNS outage at Red Hat last week is related to all of this. I don't think it's totally good. I don't. I actually don't <laughs> think that's it. Um, we. I'm joking. 
Uh, I just, there's two folks that and normally I ping to get this stuff done, Will Gordon, who also just had a child. So um, he's been out on leave and the other person is in the Czech Republic and I pinged him the week prior and I didn't, um, so I'll just ping him again and um, keep pinging until the DNS is pingable and um, we'll get there. Awesome, thank you so much for your work, Diane and Brian and everyone else who's done that. Uh, Christian, can we hear you now? Hey everybody, can you hear me? Does it work? Yes, awesome. yes, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I have a new laptop and uh, too many microphones and blue jeans insists on, on choosing the wrong one apparently. Well, now it works. Uh, so yeah, uh, regarding um, our release schedule, I think um, there's been a new release, uh, but in uh, cut a new release. Um, and yeah, I don't really have, I was out uh, last week, so I don't really have any any other news than that. Oh, uh, unfortunately, RMCI is still blocked uh, by, by some internal things with regards to our build pipeline, uh, but yeah, working on it, uh, it shouldn't be too long. Um, so hopefully uh, it's going to be an early Christmas present. Um, uh, do plan on, on getting that done uh, in the beginning of November. Awesome. Do we have a list of features or uh, of issues that needs to be solved before we can deliver for the night? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I think um, so. Vadim and I have been working on on uh, creating all the. Uh, job configurations uh, for our CI build system for Prow, um, of the, the OKD build system essentially. And we should be there soon. And uh, once we get a an upgrade uh, running, of, of finishing, um, succeeding uh, to 4.9, I think we should be ready to switch over. Uh, I haven't synced with Vadim uh, since the week before last, so uh, I don't know if there's any any current issues with that, but I'm, I'm not aware of any. Right, we have in the past, uh, Vadim has created a road to document in the past. So for example, um, back in June, he had a road to OKD 4.8 document. Um, it doesn't look like he's created one for 4.9, but we can um, create one and Christian and Vadim and anyone else can throw things in for things that are blockers or things that shortly after the release we would need to deal with. So that's, that's a great suggestion, Sandra. Um, and then also, what I think you also mentioned a, a, a list of features. That would be something to get ahead of the game. That would be really cool if we could get ahead of the game on that. And as 4.9 is coming, um, get something together that we can throw on our website, throw in social media, and throw in the chat about, hey, this is OKD 4.9 is going to feature X, Y, Z uh, cool things. So if anyone okay. wants to help with that, you know. I think that's a great idea, and I actually, uh, just before we cut the 4.8 release, which isn't too long ago, if I remember, um, I went through that list again and actually um, created PRs to update the configs for uh, all the branches that we have now, which is 4.10, 4.9. So most of that should now be in place for 4.9 as well already, and um, there shouldn't be, but we'll, we'll have to check. Um, so if somebody could open, um, open that issue and essentially copy over that list of things sure. um, that Vadim had for 4.8, um, then I'll go through it again and make sure uh, everything's in place. And yeah, with regards to features, um, I, I'm, I'm not not aware of, of that list, but it does exist, I think, and it should be the, the same feature set that um, OpenShift 4.9, yeah. uh, OCP. So um, that should really be the same, and maybe we can just copy that over. From, from some OpenShift blog yeah. posts now that 4.9. There's, there's a bunch of 4.9 um, blog posts and things like that that we could cross-reference. Um, maybe in the next docs meeting. Jamie, I, I was thinking that it might be a, um, a nice thing to take the 4.9 release update and make you the author of it, whether you do all the work or not. Um, it doesn't matter, but in order to introduce you to the, the, the greater, greater Red Hat OpenShift ecosystem, um, as, as being one of the co-chairs here. Um, and we can grab some of the content probably from the OCP updates. Uh, 
uh, Vadim just texted me he's babysitting, um, and I, I asked him if he was creating that roadmap um, for, for the road to 4.9 dock, and I haven't got a response yet, so perhaps he's got his hands full. Um, Literally. <laughs> Literally, yeah. Um, so, so I think maybe um, next week in the docs meeting, we could take that up as a, a topic and then just do and figure out how we can do that like on a regular, whenever we do have a major release, have the docs team take on doing that and then we can rotate who authors it so we can showcase different people from the working group each time. Um, and, you know, I have tons of video of people um, from the product management team talking about um, the latest release, but um, I think on the OpenShift blog, there's a few 4.9 4 release updates from, I think Rob Sumsky wrote them um, this time around, I'm not sure, um, but we can grab those and, and talk about them next Tuesday. Fantastic. One Excellent. thing that would oh, be oh, yeah, go ahead. nice to get in for 4.9 would be um, a newer Fedora CoreOS uh, release because I think we're still stuck on a pretty old version now. Um, and I, I think that last outstanding issue has now been resolved, at least that, that was a race condition, I think, somewhere. Yeah, I uh, think that was with this last up. release Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then we can sneak yeah. that into the update as well um, and maybe get a quote from Timothy as our resident Fedora person um, on there. Is there any, um, and this maybe this is for Neil and, and the Dato folks, uh, the CRC build for, for the latest release, um, is has mm -hmm. that, and, and is there any gotchas for doing a 4.9 um, code ready container release for OKD? Uh, yes. I have, um, yes. Okay. Go ahead, Daniel. I've had no time to uh, to work on that in the past uh, month, so I I don't actually know. If you have actual information, please go ahead. Yeah. So so I, I was that was actually one of the I popped out of another meeting to come over here because I wanted to talk to you guys um, to to see um, how and when we wanted to accelerate spinning up that um, special interest group, that SIG for CRC. Um, I, I'm probably just a couple of hours away from having a 4.8 build ready. Uh, it's it just because 4.8 introduced the ability to run single node clusters, uh, better, it actually breaks the CRC build because the CRC build is checking for um, things like the, the etcd quorum guard uh, and, and some stuff that went away in 4.8. Uh, so that so the 4.8 build for CRC just needs a, a few tweaks to, to complete the build of the single node cluster. Um, 4.9 is going to be a whole different ball game that I haven't even touched uh, because with the full support for snow um, I expect that really changes how CRC gets built uh, for 4.9 and to, to be honest with you guys it, it it becomes a lower priority for me because I don't use code ready containers and and if I'm being honest with this group of friends I don't actually like it <laughs> <laughs> so I've been I've been building it kind of as a favor to the community, but but it's not something I use, so so it ends yeah. up kind of falling down on my on my priority change when when I'd much rather be working on my bare metal cluster. <laughs> yeah. Do okay. do we have insight um from the OCP uh direction whether CRC is going to continue now that single node OpenShift and OKD are a thing? You know, I, I don't. I don't know because uh, actually I'm I'm this close to for my for my bare metal lab to being able to build uh, or to run the bootstrap node on my MacBook um, using using the native um, what Hyper V is no that's Windows. What's the whatever the whatever the MacBook one is and and honestly, provisor framework. Yeah, that thing. Yes, that thing. 
Um, and honestly, if if that is working, and we already know we can do something similar on you know on Linux distros, then we're really not that far away from being able to just spin up your own single node cluster uh, natively. And then you don't have all the constraints of it only being accessible from the, you know, from the workstation or things like that. So I'm not sure. It, so it, like, it sounds like CRC it. might actually just be obsoleted. Well, it, it, I, will, I will ask the product manager, Steve Spiker, um, about that because um, I, I haven't, I, I hadn't heard that feedback yet. So, um, and Charo, um, I think you probably can reach out to Steve too, but I, I I haven't heard that it's being obsoleted. Um, so in any of the messaging that I've been listening to or listening for, um, so I'll, I'll check in on that. But that's that's those are good insights, Charo. Um, and yeah. so if we're that close, um, I, yeah, um, my Mike is saying you haven't heard about going away. But um, yeah, the single node option is really kind of what we're targeting. So, 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 Charo, just with what you're working on. Do you have you actually cut down the the footprint? Because one of the one of the selling points of CRC is it actually turns off a lot of the admin stuff um, to actually make it run in a smaller footprint, so it'll run on a single laptop. So, because uh, to me that, that that is the main difference between Snow and CRC, it runs on a sixteen gig laptop. Where right. Right, and that's what that's what that the SNC.sh the the S, the single node cluster script. There, there's actually no hidden magic there because that's actually what that thing does um, when it builds the the single node cluster, and and so this may be something that our new SIG um, wants to take on is. Instead of embracing the paradigm of code-ready containers, maybe we challenge the paradigm of code-ready containers and see if there's a way for us to deliver like a, you know, a, a, a packaged and opinionated ignition config or something that, that we can just enable people to spin their, spin their own up with. Because really, that's oh. what Code Ready Containers actually does. Is it it sort of hamstrings some of the operators. It it force turns them off or or literally rips them out of the running cluster. For it, then turns the the cluster into a QCOWS image. Then gets embedded in the oh. CRC executable. I, I think the, the CRC and and single node op, um, OpenShift are slightly different use cases. So CRC is uh, as has been said, uh, it's supposed to be runnable on a laptop. It's virtualized, uh, while the single node OpenShift SNO um, is really more of a production system that is just running on on the bare metal. Um, right, it's and, an edge system. And, and, and yeah, and now the machine config operator, for example, has uh, support for for running in in that environment as a single node. So it doesn't have to be disabled anymore, like it used to be in CRC. I don't know whether they still do it in CRC or not, but um, so so maybe um, for us it, it, it's more it, it, it's more useful to have the SNO, or maybe with, maybe it is maybe it isn't. But I think um, it does have um, it, it it is a good use case that we're not yet really covering here. If you just have like this machine over there, just one machine, you can run uh, OpenShift like a full OpenShift on there, um, and having that for OKD, I think that would be uh, that would be great. And th that is the assisted installer um, that we'll have to rebuild for OKD then, and that actually doesn't require a Bootstrap node, so it'll it'll pivot from the Bootstrap node into a master, a single node master. The right. the uh, assisted installer also has support for um, compact clusters, which is like a three node um, cluster. Where also you don't need a bootstrap node. One of the masters will pivot, and uh, one of the bootstrap node will pivot into becoming one of the masters there. So uh, I do think that is very nice, and we should uh, look at um, supporting that in OKD. Yeah, and, and if I were going to throw something out for the SIG to to be thinking about, would be um, how cool would it be if we could fire up whatever our OKD CRC is from Podman Machine. If you're not familiar with Podman Machine, it's um, it's relatively new uh, and it's really slick. Oh, let me rein this in. 
let me rein this in just a little bit here, because I think we're starting to get into the discussion that the actual subgroup should be having, right? Neil, Daniel, can you organize a meeting, do you think, to get interested parties all together to talk about this? I would be happy to do that. I don't know the best way to organize a meeting among this group. We can talk to you offline about how to do that, Diane and I, and get you everything you need to round people up and get things going. Okay. All right. Any last minute thoughts on CRC? I just want to keep us moving because we do have a lot of other stuff on the agenda. I would just ask a question of this group, since Charles brought it up that he's not really using CRC. Is anyone on this group on the call right now an active user of the Code Ready container for OKD? The only usage that I know of is that we had a slew of comments in the channel and a couple of discussion items posted in regards to it, I think in spring, right, or winter, but we haven't really had any since. And so it might be helpful to explain out to the users the difference between CRC and single node and find out if really people want one or the other. Yeah. I also think it's a question of usability. I did try using it a while ago, and it's too big for a laptop. It's too sluggish. If you want Kubernetes on your laptop, use Minikube or Kind or something. They're responsive. I find CRC was just a bit too big, and everything was a bit too sluggish. And you then quickly run into the problem if you want to do too much in it, you're either going to run out of memory, or I found I run out of disk space. Right. Because on Mac, yes. the, the image isn't resizable because of the silly version of hypervisor they use. You can't resize disk images. Um, yeah. And so anecdotally, I, yeah, anecdotally, we've been doing the same thing. We used to deploy Minikube as part of our uh, as part of our dev stack. And nowadays, we're moving towards tooling that will actually spin up a full little cluster for you in AWS, just because, like, once you have the base cluster plus all the add-ons that you need for your specific environment and things like that, you end up churning like 16 gigs of memory on your laptop and life is hard. Yeah. So this is also the same kind of problem. This is also where, where things have kind of shifted for us. We still care internally about you know the local dev case, but the fundamentally something that has made made it a little harder to justify is that it's getting harder to get computers. And it's getting much harder to get computers with actual capacity in them. Uh, and that has shifted the balance of things lately, um, which is why Dan and I have deprioritized CRC so hard because I don't even have a computer that's powerful enough to run the build personally, on my like locally even. Uh, I don't have, the uh, like even if i had the crc stuff i can't run it because i don't have a computer powerful enough to do it um and this is a for a lot of the newer developers a lot of the ones that are in our teams that are using you know cloudy things containery things this is because because of the shortages and stuff that's the more common case now so i i don't know what else to say so then then my my follow-up question to that um, and thank you for the feedback. Um, is the single node option, that's snow or whatever I'm supposed to call it, is that um, too hefty out also for um, local use? Uh, yeah, it's even heftier. It's even worse. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Code ready containers that's at least a... strips out some of the some of the blow, which is why I think I think if when we when we shift this conversation over to the SIG. One of the things we'll be able to talk about is brainstorming some ideas to to strip it down. Um, yeah. Because I, I, I think I, I think the CRC team has just kind of been they've been in their channel long enough that it's become a rut. 
and and I think if we if we could pop some innovative ideas over their way, they would probably latch onto them and run. Because I, and I also know they they have other tasks that they have to do too. So CRC is not their full time job. Yeah. I, from from my the thing I I am just wondering is why isn't this just a part of snow? Like why doesn't snow just gain a smaller footprint mode because like there are there are open shift edge deployments where this would be or you know there'd be open shift cases where this makes sense to even be able to hit the same kind of target sizes that crc does like i don't think it's unreasonable to say you know maybe you don't need all the metrics and monitoring operators and services deployed on a single node open shift configuration in some cases Maybe you don't need all the, you yeah. know, some of the other extra fancy stuff there. Like maybe you don't need the service catalog or whatever, you know, based on, you know, a profile that is passed to SNO deployments or something like that. Like, I, I just don't I know why this isn't like, happening there too. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's, like but that's... That is in the works so for example we're going to uh, we're going to throw out jenkins um out of the core payload um i think with the next release and obviously it's a process um but yeah if, if you have um suggestions what could be cut down um please do do voice them and we'll we'll try to um you know uh, get that to to the uh to the respective teams so they can work on making their component optional. Um, and I know that the the, the cutting this single node, uh, single node uh, open shift uh, use case down is it's definitely on the agenda. It's an ongoing thing, but it's not going to be it's it's going to be a steady process. Like it's going to be smaller right. in the future. But right now we can't just say we're gonna not gonna you know use that component. Um, but yeah, right. it's, it's definitely on on your roadmap. So, so Diane, a, a suggestion might be um, when Daniel arranges a meeting, can we invite any of the um, CRC core team yeah. from Red Hat into the working group? That, that sounds like there could be win-win. That's yeah. what I was thinking. I'll, I'll reach out to the PM for it, the product manager, Steve, um, and see who he can, if he can come and hear, hear what we're saying, first of all, and then if there's some resource um, or roadmap for for making it smaller or making it more useful, and or where we and the other thing is where we can, as a working group can be useful to them to aid and abet their their work. Um, I, and a, and so I'm going to let Jamie drive us on to the next topic because I think I ran that one into the ground for you. So. Um, and I'm going to go to my next meeting. <laughs> Thanks right. for showing up, Charo. Much appreciated. Welcome to Red Hat. There's multiple meetings all the time. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. All right, take care, man. Good. All right, uh, Daniel and Neil, if you're still interested uh, in uh, leading that group, we can get you set up on reaching out to people and getting everything together. Uh, so Diane and I will reach out to you for that. Let's move on now to issues in the repo. If any issues um, stuck out to folks that we need to address, or do they point to something larger that... Um, that we need to do. We have, haven't really gotten a lot um, in, and there's a couple of documentation ones actually uh, that came in, they're labeled as such. And um, I don't know, does anyone see anything in issues that you want to talk about real quick? I was actually just taking a look through it. Doesn't seem like there's anything too interesting. Um, and Vadim's been real good about asking people for most gathers, and so far, yeah, uh, haven't seen too many of those yet. So, yeah, yeah, and actually, he closes a fair amount and moves issues to discussions because a lot of time people are opening issues yeah. for uh, things that are more discussion. Which leads us to the next section. Uh, is there anything in discussions that folks wanted uh, to talk about? Um, that a I handful of items come in. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so at long last, I've um, I've been able to run through the um, the IPI install on um, on OpenStack, um, and so I I wrote up a bunch of notes for myself. There there were some 
Um, there were some kind of major things that prevented the cluster from coming up, and then there were a bunch more minor paper cuts where a lot of them were just the docs could be better in, in particular areas. So um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to get all this written up. Should I file like six or seven different tickets? Should I write up uh, one document and then people can decide whether they want it to be tickets? Um, should I start making pull requests? Like, um, what, what's what's the best way to get this uh, to get this organized and useful to everybody? I would. Well, let me let's let, let me let other folks voice their thoughts on this. What do other folks think? So my my two cents would be to start an issue um, with a, a list of of the items. Or okay, just like one issue, issue in 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 the OKD tracker. I would say a discussion. Uh, okay. Yeah, open a discussion probably. item because some of these things might be actual issues. Some of them might be something that needs to be a documentation that's, log file. Yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to figure out. Okay. Yeah, I would I would do a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, that's a discussion in the GitHub project for. Yep. Exactly. Uh, yep. Okay. And that's cool. that's where we're trying to direct folks to things that are not necessarily bugs, but there might be conversation about techniques or. Uh, process or you know something like that or something you're not sure if it's a bug or whatever yeah cool okay yeah I'll um I'll start a discussion I'll I'll write up kind of bullet points of what my experience was and then we can we can go from there figuring out how to best turn them into into action thank you excellent um so I do want to say other than uh, a couple things it was a surprisingly smooth and delightful process um so I'm really, really impressed that uh, at, at the work that everybody has done at, at getting to this to such a pleasant experience. So thank you, everybody. So, so in the end, you did manage to get it deployed and, and running already? Yep. Yes, several several times with different configurations for different reasons, so yes. So what I would also love to do maybe is, well, let's do the discussion, but also do a little uh, write up um, blog posty thing or even do a um, recording of it because that seems to be how people digest stuff of, of walking through it. So if at some point you um, have spare time, that would be a great thing. I can record that with you or help you get that done. Um, just the step by step stuff. Oh, I see. Just like just like a, a screencast or something of, of me yeah. going through it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that uh, I'd be I'd be happy to do something like that. Be cool. We used that to have more of those, but they sort of tapered off the past six months or so. But folks yeah. find those really helpful to watch someone actually go through the process of these. We haven't done I'm one sure in a while. I'm sure we could also probably, since we we did an IPI, um, a non-trivial IPI setup, we can probably clean those up a bit and put it somewhere as associated like reference material for such a screencast or whatever, so people can. And see what it is, because like that would be uh, that'd probably be beneficial for people, because like it seems like the OpenStack one, even though it is one of the better supported providers, seems to be the one that has uh, some of the least uh, comprehensive documentation, mm -hmm. um, and that that kind of stinks. Yeah, when, when the new site goes live, I mean, we we created the user guide off the last sort of um, trial day, it'd be good to actually maybe put a user guide in for OpenStack, but then put a link to a YouTube video or a, a guided walkthrough on how to do it, just so people can easily find it. Yeah, and then I can reach out to the OpenStack community and do some, do some PR for us there and maybe get some more folks playing and using it. So well done. Excellent. All right, we'll add this as a task. Um, next up, Mike, you had something here about RPMs. Yeah, so uh, a little preps here. Neil, I promise this is purely coincidental. Um, the other day, I was just kind of messing around, and um, I was like, kind of curious, like, were the OC and like OpenShift install binaries available in Fedora to just RPM install? They were not. There is a Kubernetes package for the kubectl stuff. Um, but I was like, okay, well, let's try packaging up. I want to see if I can package up the actual KD binaries for a given stream into Fedora. And I was able to generate 
um, a, a COPER or a COPPER repo that does contain uh, an OKD and an OKD install binary. I did rename them um, so they wouldn't conflict if someone wanted to install the OpenShift binaries. Um, but I was wondering if it was actually a useful thing to have available in Fedora, considering I'm, I'm not fully uh, aware of the entire process of like if a given binary can only install a specific version that they that it comes bundled with, or if you can pick different streams to install with any given uh, installer. But I want to see if it would be useful to have the actual client library, client and installer binaries available in Fedora for people to just DNF install and be able to get going versus having to go to GitHub, download a tarball, extract it, put it in their path, and do that kind of thing. I, I think that would be useful. useful. Yes. That I awesome. actually automate that exact process in an Ansible playbook right now, and I just have that running in the background on a timer. So having a repo would be a step up for sure. So I have this. Um... And Mike, with regards to your question, so each binary release has a, a version of Fedora CoreOS uh, that it uses hard-coded in it, but you can uh, override that with an environment variable. Okay. Is it possible to make a build of it where, the, where that manifest of information is actually split out to a config file? Uh, well, it's not supported right now, I think, but that might be an interesting enhancement for all of OpenShift, actually. Yeah, because I'm thinking of, so the, the thing I'm thinking of is, so Dan and I have been internally talking about, you know, offering, a, you know, a way for people to, like, push button OpenShift deploy or, like, do whatever for, like, a very small OpenShift as a service cluster with some basic configuration up front. But we also want to validate which versions that people are actually using, and we want to, to some degree, control the flow that that people wind up using. And one thing that kind of makes this a little bit of a challenge relative to some of the other bits is um, it's not straightforward to just like make OpenShift install do different things by default. Um, and you know maybe some kind of config drop in or whatever, like Mike's thing could like the mics build of it that as a package could actually like read that and that would make it meaningfully simpler to be able to do the right thing like i don't imagine that the installer code like the core code of the installer changes as much as the stuff that it fetches to actually do the deployment um but you know i could be wrong about all these things but like i i feel like it makes some degree of sense to be able to do that kind of thing Okay, do, do do we actually want the the sort of general public doing that from a support point of view? I understand if you're technically capable, but if we have sort of people just poking any old version of Fedora in, I can imagine our forums are going to be a support nightmare. So this is not about po poking random versions of Fedora in. This is you know, shipping the installer and client binaries in Fedora to be able yeah, yeah. to orchestrate yeah. the installation based yeah. on things that our manifests have. The, diff the problem right now is that as part of the compilation process, the manifest is merged inside of the binary executable rather than being a separate file that we that an admin can set up. So there's, there's um, this and <laughs> Core's perspective on this. Um, we do that because essentially when we bake version into OpenShift installer, it makes sure that the version actually works. So that we test that the version that you're going to boot uh, is, is working at least and you can get a cluster with this version. And we don't update from an OpenShift perspective, we don't um, support users updating their boot images so switching the images they boot their cluster on so um, you should you keep essentially using the same image to boot your cluster for the whole lives of your cluster for kd i don't know how much this would be tested but i don't think this is tested either so essentially you still should use the same image you've used in the beginning to boot um, your cluster. I think we're talking past each other a little bit. I'm just talking about setting the OKD version that it fetches to install. Yeah, but the, the OKD version itself is completely coupled with the version, the boot image, and 
Right, but that can all be that's all part of a manifest of sorts, right? Like if you say I want to install OKD 480-2021-1015 or some made up date or whatever, right? That references a point in time that you've released a bunch of blobs, it has a referential point to a fcos image and so on and so on and so on, right? Like that is a thing that exists. What I'm saying is that the OpenShift install binary does not by default expose that as a configurable item. Like what but, it fetches yeah. to start provisioning. I think I understand what oh, you yeah. want to do, but I don't understand the what you get from it. Like right now, when you get a specific binary of OpenShift install, whether it's for OpenShift or OKD, you've got everything in it, so you know that this specific configuration has been tested. Uh, and if you want to do the overrides, then you go ahead, you have got some two or three variables that you can use, environment variables that you can use to do the overrides. Um, but if you split this, then it means that once you've got like some random version of the OpenShift installer binary, coupled with some random version of the of a manifest or whatever version you want to install or whatever OKD or something else. Uh, and who's going to guarantee that this actually works? Like, We already don't have that guarantee. Uh, yeah, we do. We do. Like, no, we right don't. Now, we, we, don't. We, do. we don't have that we, guarantee. We it have a guarantee that right when we ship an OpenShift installer, when we ship that, we ship with the specific ARCOS or FCOS version. And we ship the specific version of OCP, and this one boots and works on all the cluster we test for. So this is like non, in a sense, it's non-negotiable. Like we know that this, this works because we test it before we ship it. Otherwise, we don't ship it. And if we split that up, then it means that you will use combination which potentially don't work. So. Part of the reason why I brought this up is when I said coincidence earlier, is I went into the GitHub project because trying to find where the agendas were. I forgot they were on HackMD. And um, at the very bottom of the to-do list, there's a card for Fedora packages or Fedora RPMs that, have, that I've came across after I actually got these things to build. Um, the, the point of me proposing this or asking if this is a good idea or not is because, like, as it is right now, so the binaries I built come from the 2021-1024 cut. They're the latest cut available. When a new version gets cut, if I don't update that package, when people do an install, it's still going to install the 1024 one. But if I upgrade to the new one, now people, if they're trying to run with their same stuff, they're going to be running off a newer stream and not their old stuff. I don't know if that's going to cause a problem or not. So from a packaging standpoint, I was like, is this a good idea in the first place to have, considering that's not the way like OpenShift itself kind of works? Or am I going to be causing uh, problems for people down the line if we were to start all of a sudden they were getting updates for the installer and the client that they weren't expecting to get kind of thing? Um, I also wasn't sure with like for the major, quote unquote, major versions like 4.8, 4.9, 4.10, managing those side by side, if they would, that would be something usable to put in like a modularity stream for selectivity. But I don't know if this is a good idea as a whole to have them available considering it's not, the installer is not version agnostic as right now. Or yeah. it seems that way. The, the, the only option that would be, would be to have like the version of OCP well, there's there's complete binding between the data and the install by itself because there's a bunch of uh, manifests and everything that's generated. So you can not just like use a random version of the installer and a random version of boot image and OCP release and expect that to work. So I don't know I, what I speed would get you. I think there's there's some merit to both sides, but with OKD, we, we use a slightly different process than with OCP in that we have the boot image, but then we pivot right away into the machine OS content um, that is part of the OKD payload. So we do have some more leeway that as, as long as we can pivot from the boot image version of Fedora Core OS, it doesn't really matter what we what we pivot into then, because it'll always be the version the right version for the reference payload. So you can, using this OpenShift install release image override uh, and var, you can override the the payload, that's the, the release image from the payload you're referencing there, not not a different FCOS version. It'll still, the, the first boot will still be the 
the Fedora CoreOS version that is hard coded in that installer binary that you're running, but then it'll it'll pivot right away into the right um, OS version for that for that uh, OKD version that you're trying to install. So and and that as long as we we still just use the, the same pivot mechanism, which is essentially an RPM OS tree rebase. Um, Oh, I didn't know that you can overwrite the boot image. That might be that might be interesting, but it shouldn't it shouldn't really matter because as long as we we have something that boots and that has RPM OS tree in it, we can kind of use that to 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 then pivot over into the into the operating system that is part of the payload. And kind of it's a it's a right now how how we build the machine OS content is a bit messy in that we. We don't really do it on our own CI. Um, Vadim has set up the Cirrus CI for it, which works great, but it's still like we, we don't control that entirely. There is um, this enhancement uh, from Colin Walters, though, and that will really make things much, much easier because then we can kind of just take a Fedora CoreOS and layer stuff on top, making that easily layer things on top um, as a Docker build. Um, or Plotman build, and that'll be the the OKD machine OS, um, and I think that that's going to be that's going to make things uh, much more streamlined there because, uh, yeah, it, it'll be much easier to build the machine OS in the first place, and also it'll be easier um, for if if you want to have your own package installed on the on the on the image you boot from in the first place, it'll be easier to create that image. Um, there, there's, I think, in the CoreOS team, more efforts going on to actually kind of have a have the OS tree delivered in a in a con, in a container and create boot images from the container image. So eventually, what we're aiming at is not having these boot images um, as part of the required things you need to mirror uh, in the first place. But you just mirror up containers, and then from one container, you kind of uh, create the boot image yourself with, an, with a documented, easy to do process. Um, so th there is going to be some changes in that area. And uh, I don't think it, it makes sense to, to kind of uh, make, make, make this uh, such a huge problem. If, if, if the versions don't match entirely, exactly, it, it might not work. It's definitely not tested, but it could work too. But in the future, it'll be easier to just. Uh, Create your own image um, from the payload. Actually, yeah, create the machine OS in the first place, and then create a boot image from the machine OS content uh, that is in the payload. Given that, so slide, if, maybe if we people should... if people do find this something that's potentially practical, I'm happy to go further on and actually try packaging it and getting this into proposing as a package for Fedora and whatnot. Um, but obviously, I want to get feedback whether or not this is something that's at this current point in time, is something that's usable or would be useful to have. At the very minimum, having the OpenShift client, yeah, package the client tooling would be, would be extremely huge. useful because it's quite yes, a I, pain I, uh, right now. Like, yeah, I do I have see. the OKD client or the OC binary in the in the in the copper um, renamed to OKD and doing a lot of setting to get the bash completion to not conflict with OC. Um, it's also not. It's, I'm also kind of hacking around with the actual OC when I was looking into the OC build process is some heavy nested make file work. Um, and I kind of bypass all of that by just calling the go build directly as best I could. Um, so I need feedback whether that's a <laughs> good thing to do or by bypassing the, the standard make process. Um, but I do have that bundled up and it seems from the at least initial stuff functional, but I haven't actually done any against cluster testing. so. And as for OpenShift install, um, I think that's one of those things that's going to wind up being useful to have as a modular. If you if you decide to go forward with packaging it, doing it with um, modular streams and doing it on the feature versions, Definitely. you know, four eight, four nine, and whatever, and then set them up with EOL so that they retire fairly aggressively. Sure. Uh, I think it would be super useful and it'd make people, it'd make life easier for for people. But uh, between the two, I would say having the client tools shipped is really, really important. 
the installer is a big pile of insanity. Um, and so that's, that's, that might, it might be worth having a, a longer discussion with the OpenShift install developers about handling this case a little better. Um, but it is certainly a, a long, I think it's a valuable longer term thing. So let's, uh, we got to move on. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, I think we're all basically saying to Mike, go for it. Uh, Definitely. And, uh, we can give feedback post stuff in the working group, um, either as a discussion item uh, in the repo or actually a discussion item in the repo would be good because then people from all over can. So post this as a discussion item in the repo and give folks, um, you know, the commands there that you have for testing and whatnot, and let's go from there. I, if we're back to the agenda, I had one more question. Christian, I did see that you um, submitted a talk for uh, DevConf um, and attached my name to it. I am assuming that's an OKD-related talk? It, yeah, I, I actually submitted one talk uh, about OKD for DevConf in uh, Czech Republic, and I also uh, submitted a, a meetup uh, for okay. OKD. And that's that okay. one I tagged you on as well. All right. Um, so that's you... just a a kind of hybrid in-person virtual event uh, or o OKD working group meeting uh, at yep. DEF CON. If, if we get the slot, I, I do expect it. Yeah, to. no, I'm, I'm pretty sure. If you put my name on both of those, I can't, for some reason, it doesn't sh let me, I can see that you put my name on at least one of them. If you could put my name on the, that, and um, I was just going to flag, Jamie, I don't know if you have the budget to travel to the Czech Republic or the desire um, to do so, but um, maybe we could we could chat about that again um, and see see if that's a possibility um, and, and do some socializing either that or um, participate via the, the virtual stuff. We usually get that slot, um, both of those um, at, at DevConf CZ, so thank you for doing that. Um, and hopefully hopefully we'll actually be able to go. Excellent. All right, let's uh, move on. We got a couple of quick ones to get through here. Uh, Diane, can you confirm uh, that we can have stuff forwarded through the OKD Twitter? Uh, if you haven't yet, uh, let us know. Um, the idea being that we we wouldn't get our own Twitter, but we would, or we would get our own Twitter, but at least have stuff forwarded through there, depending. Um, but if you could have them post our content uh, when we need it, that would be great. Um, our content on the OpenShift and Com OpenShift Commons one, or are you? Sorry, I, yeah, I missed Open, it. Yeah, OpenShift Commons one, or or the general OpenShift one. Anything that you can do to leverage. Yeah. So, that so we don't any, necessarily anything, have to get our own Twitter. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I missed the I apologies. I missed the last docs meeting, um, and so I can post anything I want on OpenShift Commons relative to OKD. So that's not a problem. If there's anything, and maybe each time we do like a blog or anything like that, we just automatically do that. I usually use the hashtag OKD. Um, I, the, I think the last time I talked to Pit folks. Were we thinking about creating a Twitter uh, handle for OKD? Was that another thing you wanted to do? We, we did, and I think this actually falls in line with one other question. There's, we wanted to do a Twitter, possibly, if legal would allow it, and then also we wanted to have a separate repo if legal will allow it. So yep. those are two things that we need to do to run by legal. Okay, I can handle that, and we will talk about that, the results of that on next week's docs meeting. Excellent, great. Uh, we have four more minutes left. Uh, there was discussion about bare metal CI and testing group. I do now have a um, uh, uh, some bare metal that I can test on if anyone else does, just to try to um, have some something that we can talk about with people or or have you know um, at least create a testing matrix for bare metal so that we can get some results. Um, let me know, folks, if you're interested in that. Wanted to squeeze in one thing. Um, uh, Driti is taking care of uh, the survey that we talked about, the OKD survey, to get a sense of um, what users uh, are doing um, with OKD. And so um, she's on leave this week, uh, but we'll be back next week, and we'll have a report to us and any questions uh, about moving forward uh, with the survey. And so we have three minutes left, and is there anything else that we haven't covered yet? I think okay. that's everything, but anything else? 
No? All right. Cool. All right. So task list, uh, basically, Diane is going to check on the two uh, things, Twitter and the repo. Have you put uh, those yeah. in as, as issues um, and or as tasks in GitHub? Have we started doing that? Um, I, we haven't done them as tasks yet, but we could, yeah, for sure. Some tasks for me. Um, okay. Absolutely. And assign D. Mueller 2001 my GitHub ID to him, and let's see if that makes me do things better. Okay, tasks. sounds good. Mike, you're going to post a discussion message uh, with your work. Uh, Daniel's going to post a discussion message with his work. And um, uh, what else did we have from this meeting? Uh, Jamie, you're going to follow up with me about scheduling yes, the CRC right. working group meeting. Uh, right, do you want right. to just do that by email? Do you have my email address? Yeah, yeah, I do have your email address. Okay, so Diane, Diane and I will, will do, do that. that. We'll, we'll, Diane we'll hit you up about recording that, um, the, 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 the install of on OpenStack. I think yeah. there's a, a good a bit of outreach we can do to the OpenStack community once you have that done, Daniel. So kudos um, if you can find the time to do that. Uh, Mike Rochford, um, the task, the the stuff that you're doing to get the Fedora over there, is there an issue link for that? Um, or is uh, that there is not, but in the uh, project uh, card layout, I'm not sure if that's still actively used. Um, really the very right. bottom of the to-do list is a Fedora RPM um, card or build RPMs in Fedora environment, yeah, which I just do it as across. a discussion. Yeah, just put it in as a discussion. Yep. Yeah. discussion and and link put that link or whatever the past link in that that the note and you know what I love about Jamie is that he's on top of all of these things and let's use the, the discussion stuff and move this stuff forward so thank you everybody especially Jamie and last item is I I'm Diane found one error in the video intro to that I created for our, our meetings turns out that my conversion to a ping to import it in my video software screwed up the head of, of our little mascot so I'm doing an export again from the from the initial file to ping and then recreating the video and it's all in Red Hat font and it'll look great. So expect all of our future meetings to have that intro at the beginning. It's awesome. Right. Bring Thanks, back the folks. Thanks guys. Take care.